Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today I'm continuing the study of the book of John, and I'm going to pick up where I left off last time, chapter 19, beginning with verse 32. Now, if you have not seen the previous studies on John, I urge you, please watch this from the beginning. All the videos were uploaded and available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Please uh, take the book of John seriously. I believe it's the most important book in the, of the entire Bible. And now, I'm a KJV firstist, so I look at the KJV first, and sometimes I will look at another translation if I feel that it, it could be helpful. Uh, the translation I like to use is the Amplified because the Amplified is kind of a, a combination of a translation and a uh, commentary. So let's begin. John chapter 19, verse 32. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with the spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he saw that it bare record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he, that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. Well, um, what happened here is that in order for someone crucified to um, continue living, they had to continue breathing. And in order to breathe, um, their wrists are nailed to the cross, their feet are nailed to the cross, and they're hanging from that cross. And in that position, they cannot catch a breath. So what they're forced to do is pull in with their arms and push with their feet, raising themselves up in order to take air into their lungs. And it's a tortuous, every breath is excruciating, hence the word crucifixion and excruciate, the same root word. Uh, so uh, at a certain time, uh, if the uh, crucified person had not died, and usually it takes a day or, two, or more, two days, uh, be, of this torture before they finally succumb and die. Uh, but uh, it, it is common for the soldiers, though, to break the legs of the person so that they cannot use their legs to push up and catch a breath. And that way, uh, it's only a matter of a minute before they, they definitely die, once their legs are broken. That's the reason the Romans would break their legs, when they figure, well, enough time has passed, let's just end this, break their legs. Uh, but the scriptures uh, tell us that uh, not one bone of the Messiah's legs would be broken. And now, as I, I believe that, uh, I mentioned this last time, that uh, there, there are two chapters, uh, there's more than that, but the two chapters that come to my mind that in the Old Testament that are very clear descriptions of the Jesus' crucifixion are in um, Isaiah chapter 53 and Psalm chapter 22. I hope you'll read those and with this in mind, read read the, this chapter of John, which describes the crucifixion, and then read Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22, and you'll see that this is an actual fulfillment in great detail of the, the description you find in the Old Testament. Now, the interesting thing is Isaiah was written about 700 years before Jesus' death. Uh, David wrote Psalms about a thousand years before Jesus' death. And at the time of their writing, there was no such thing as act as a crucifixion. It was not even uh, thought of and developed as a means of execution at that time in history. So these these prophecies are have even more power 
in that they they predict a form of um, execution that ha wasn't even invented yet, and they go, it goes into great detail explaining this suffering of Jesus on the cross and his death, and it says that his not one of his bones would be broken, and now the 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 thief on each side of Jesus, they both had their legs broken. Now, Jesus' legs were not broken. As the scriptures say, not one bone was broken, would be broken. And that's that's the way it actually transpired with Jesus. So that's why this is very, very significant. Let me read these, chapter, these verses here in the Amplified, uh, beginning with verse 32. Uh, so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who had been crucified. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Obviously, if he's already dead, there's no reason to break his legs. Uh, the purpose of breaking the legs is so that they will die very quickly because they're unable to uh, continue breathing. Uh, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came flowing out. Now this was just to test, to, to, to make certain that he was dead. He appeared to be dead, and they wanted to make sure. So they used the spear in his side, and it's, uh, it says, and immediately blood and water came flowing out. And you'd expect blood to come come out, but water, um, I, I don't recall the exact like medical uh, uh, reasoning behind this, but I, I, I remember studying that the, the fact that there was water was further evidence that he was already dead. Um, somehow, after you die, the water, I guess, uh, your body starts uh, you know, getting water in, in the heart, or I don't know. I don't know enough about it to really tell you right now, but it's interesting how the fact that there's blood and water, this is a significant detail. Uh, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came flowing out. And he, John, the eyewitness, who has seen it, has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you also who read this may believe. See, that's the whole point of John writing this book. I believe in chapter 21, he, he makes a statement that the whole purpose of writing this gospel of John is uh, so that we can believe in Jesus and receive salvation through through our faith. Uh, so that's the point of the book, and it seems he seems to be making the same case here. He's concerned. He wants to tell you that this is exactly what happened. I'm an eyewitness to these events. I'm writing this down. It's true, and uh, I'm, I'm, you need to believe this. Uh, now, verse 36, for these things took place to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of his shall be broken. Uh, and again, another scripture says, they shall look at him whom they have pierced. Okay, uh, I didn't read that in the KJV yet, let me see. And again, another scripture said, they shall look on him whom they pierced. So these two um, statements not a bone of his shall be broken, and they shall look at him whom they have pierced. These are quotes from the Old Testament. Let me see if there's verse 36 and 37, if there's a footnote. Um, there's not a footnote here. Uh, usually these footnotes can be helpful because it, it, it directs us to the actual place in the Old Testament where this was written. Okay, as I said, I think you'll find this in Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22. Um, now let's go back to the KJV and verse 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus. Now the interesting thing about this, Joseph of Arimathea, um, along with Nicodemus, uh, were both disciples or they believed in Jesus. And they, a disciple is someone who learns from him. So they were listening to him and being taught by him. Uh, they, uh, they were members of the Sanhedrin. They were highly respected religious leaders. Uh, 
And um, so not only these two, but I'm sure that there were some others that uh, listened to Jesus and believed in him. But the Sanhedrin, uh, headed by the high priest uh, uh, Caiaphas, they're the ones that arrested Jesus, put him on trial, and then sent him to Pontius Pilate to be tried and, and sentenced to death. Uh, so Joseph of Arimathea is, it's, he's in the Sanhedrin, which was the, the body that, uh, I, I believe that Joseph of Arimathea and also uh, uh, Nicodemus, I believe that, I don't remember if it's in the scriptures or if it's just in some uh, historical records that they, uh, uh, they had this trial uh, at a time of night that it was not legal to have it. And they did it in secret, not inviting those people who, uh, or not notifying those people who they, they felt would be on Jesus' side. They purposely uh, did it in secret and, and uh, so that only the people in attendance uh, those were only the people who um, uh, would be, would vote guilty, who would agree that uh, they wanted to get rid of Jesus and kill him. Uh, so it says, uh, and after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. So see, uh, he, he had to keep his faith secret because he was afraid that, uh, you know, the Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, would turn against him too, just as the, the apostles and disciples. Uh, they fled and hid after his death, after his arrest, because they were afraid that they'd also come looking for them if they, if they were uh, followers or believers of, in Jesus. But secretly, for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. So uh, Joseph of Arimathea is also uh, known as a rich man who owned the tomb that Jesus was buried in. And there's another prophecy that says that he would be buried in a rich man's tomb. Now, Jesus, he wasn't rich. He didn't have uh, he didn't have the money to to buy a uh, a, a tomb, uh, and uh, so. Normally, they would just throw him into uh, Gehenna for his body to be rot and be burned up. Uh, if you, there's a movie that came out about a year ago, I think, called the title is Risen. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I hope you'll find a way of uh, seeing that that movie. It's very, very uh, correct biblically and historically, and you can see there the the politics and the arguments that were taking place about what to do with Jesus's body, and. But because Joseph of Arimathea came and asked for the body and pleaded with the Pontius Pilate, gave him the body, he would be buried uh, in a rich man's tomb instead of his body to be cast into the rubble in a, a pile of bodies uh, in what's known as Gehenna. Um, 39, verse 39, And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night. Uh, this is in chapter three, the encounter with Jesus and Nicodemus when Jesus is telling Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus doesn't understand that this is spiritual language. So you can go back to the study on chapter three uh, to get a, recant, a recount of that. Um, and there came, also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. So this is part of the, the burial procedure. Um, and verse 40, then took they the, holy, the, the, the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. It's all very significant too. Uh, and particularly if you've ever uh, looked up the topic of the Shroud of Turin. And I, I'm uh, on the side of believing that the Shroud of Turin is, is the actual burial uh, cloth or shroud of Jesus. Uh, but you can, you know, Google Shroud of Turin, or uh, it's on the History Channel just about every year. They do documentaries on this subject. 
uh, people arguing whether this is Jesus' burial cloth or some kind of a, a, a forgery. Uh, but uh, the, the fact that he's wrapped in this shroud and there's this aloe and these spices and this is all part of the procedure for, for burial and that all contributes to how this uh, shroud, uh, you know, was, um, it, it all matches up perfectly when you study the shroud. Uh, it seems to, it's very, very convincing that this is his burial cloth and the, uh, and the image of Jesus is clearly seen on it through some miraculous thing at the resurrection. It seemed like some kind of radiation or something was came about so that it took, takes a, like a, a photographic image of Jesus' body and, and his face. It's fascinating and it's, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, it, it, I believe it can enhance our faith. Even though some people have tried to disprove it, uh, it's, I believe that they're, they're, the attempts to disprove it are, uh, are part of uh, you know, the fraud against the shroud and fraud against Jesus and the Bible. So let me read these verses in the Amplified. Uh, verse 38, And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took away the body. Nicodemus, who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred Roman pounds. So they took Jesus' body, bound it in linen, wrapping it with the fragrant spices as is the burial custom, of the Jews. Okay, now let's go to verse 41 in the KJV. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. Well, they needed to bury him quickly because of the timing of the um, um, uh, all, all these events, the idea that a Jew must be buried right away and also that uh, this was the holiday of the Passover. All these things were factors so that Jesus needed to be buried quickly and Joseph of Arimathea a rich man in the Sanhedrin who was also a believer in Jesus, he offered his a tomb in his garden, uh, and therefore Jesus was buried in that tomb, and it also fulfills the scripture that said Jesus, the Messiah, would be buried in a rich man's tomb. Okay. All right, that concludes chapter 19. Um, the final thing I want to say is, is my custom that, um, uh, we could study for the Bible from, from A to Z, from Genesis through Revelation. We can become scholarly and expert in all of it. And yet there's one, one subject in the Bible one theme or question that rises above everything else in importance. And as a matter of fact, I'm sure I have all that kind of illustrates the point. And so, I don't know if you can read it, it's very faint. It says, if you died today, where would you go? It's, a, it's kind of a, a diagnostic question. When you ask someone that question, or another question like it is, um, are you certain you're going to heaven, and if so, why? Or another question is, why should God let you into heaven? These questions, um, when posed and answered, can uh, give us the, the answer. It will indicate whether the person is saved or not. Um, and so we can diagnose their condition. Are they saved or not? And that's the purpose of asking a question like that. So I will ask you the question right now. If you died today, where would you go? Uh, some people say, well, you don't go anywhere. You just, there's nothing after death. There's just the end and it's 
uh, you, you don't exist anymore. Well, uh, if that's if that's what you believe, it's 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 sad because the uh, if you study the Bible, if you go through all my playlists on science, God in the Bible, prophecies in the Bible, biblical apologetics, if you'll take the time to study all those things, you'll find that there's overwhelming evidence that there is life after death. The Bible is true, and Jesus is our great Savior God. <clears throat> but some people have their mind made up already, and they don't want to even consider there's a po the possibility of life after death and a judgment by God. Um, but the the other answer is, uh, where would I go if I died today? Would I go to heaven? Would I go to hell? Do you even believe in these two uh, destinations? Uh, the Bible says there is a real heaven and a real hell. So where would you go? Uh, most people think, well, I, I think I will go to heaven, or at least I'm, I'm hoping I'll go to heaven, and it's because I'm a, a, a good person, or at least I'm a pretty good person, or at least I'm not as bad as these other people I, I could point out. I'm certainly not as bad as Hitler. So... Uh, most people think that um, whether you go to heaven or hell is determined by personal merit. If you're good enough, you go to heaven. If you're not good enough, you go to hell. Or particularly if you're real bad, you go to hell. But that's the philosophy of the world, and that is a lie from the devil. Uh, the truth is, the Bible says that there's only one way for us to go to heaven, and that is because of our faith in Jesus Christ, our great Savior God. The Bible says that we cannot go to heaven through personal merit. Because if we wanted to, you know, if we thought we could go to heaven through personal merit, the Bible says that you have to be perfect. You'd have to be able to die and go in front of God and plead your case and say, my entire life, I've been completely innocent. I've never done one thing wrong. In fact, I've never even had one bad thought. I've done nothing but good my whole life. I'm perfect. The only person that could really honestly make that claim is Jesus Christ. The Bible says, the rest of us, we all fall short of the glory of God. The glory of God is the standard set by Jesus Christ. The standard is perfection. So if, if you can, if you're confident you could go board for God and say, I've been perfect my whole life, never did one thing wrong, then in that case, you don't need Jesus. But in, in reality, you have to confess, you, you can't honestly make that claim unless you're insane or deluded. And that's why the Bible says that we need to be saved. The Bible says the wages of sin, the wages of your sin and my sin is death. Not only death when we die and we're buried, but there's a resurrection, a judgment, and a second death for those who didn't put their faith in Jesus. The second death is the lake of fire where we are consumed and annihilated and perish if we have not received salvation. So uh, if you understand that you could never go before God and say, I've been perfect, I deserve heaven because I'm perfect. Um, if you can admit that you're not perfect and therefore you need to be rescued, to, to be saved. The Bible says there's one Savior, it's God. The one the Bible says that Jesus Christ is our Savior. Jesus Christ is our Savior, God. And the Bible says the means of salvation is faith in Jesus Christ. Faith means you believe in him for your salvation. Uh, a Christian is a person who has faith that they are going to go to heaven because of Jesus. I believe I'm going to go to heaven because of Jesus. I'm not going to go to heaven because of my personal merit. I'm not going to go to heaven because I've worked so hard at being good and over, overcome sin and I've done good deeds. No, I've rejected that. I've understood that's a hopeless scenario. It's impossible. And that's when you realize it's impossible to go to heaven based on your own merit, that's when you understand your need for the Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Jesus is eternal God Almighty. He came down from heaven. God manifest in the flesh. God became a man named Jesus Christ, the Son of God. 
He became a man in order to die. God cannot die, so he had to become a man to die. He had to die because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. He died so that you could live. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, if, never, if nobody's ever told you this before, I wouldn't be surprised. This is good news, and it's shocking good news. And that is that salvation, um, eternal life in heaven, is a free gift that Jesus offers us everyone. He's offering it to you right now. It's a free gift. You don't have to work for it by being religious. You don't have to buy it through charitable donations or tithing. Um, you, you, you can't do that. It's impossible because the gift was bought and paid for by Jesus Christ. He paid for it with his death, suffering, and blood, shed blood on that cross. And he's offering it to you as a free gift. Uh, you don't have to do anything to receive it except accept it in faith. Accept the fact, believe that Jesus has just given you eternal life in heaven. That you are assured, that you're certain, that you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven. Not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. He died for your sins. And then he was raised from the dead on the third day to give us a sign. Jesus said this bodily resurrection that he would do that was the purpose of it was to give us a sign that his claims are true he is god he is the savior he does have power over life and death so believe in jesus christ for your salvation depend on him completely rely on him reject any other means of salvation Re reject any other person as your savior you even reject the idea that you could possibly re get your own redemption through your own efforts reject all that and depend completely on jesus trust him depend on him rely on him and have faith in him have faith that he has the ability to give you eternal life and have faith that he is faithful to keep his promise and at that moment you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven. Thank you for watching, and I'll begin chapter 20 next time. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.